how would the biblical writers have thought about what they were writing? I'll tell you how they wouldn't have thought about it. They wouldn't have thought about it the way it's presented on YouTube. Okay, they wouldn't have thought about it the way it's presented on Facebook. There's a context here. It is live or be killed. But there are verbs associated not with killing in the commands to take the land. It's not all killing. In other words, God would have been happy for a number of people to just be driven out or to be dispossessed. You don't have to kill them. And you, have, you get the references there. You get some in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, again, Numbers, Joshua 3, I mean, Urash. It is a fallacy, it's untrue, to say that the conquest was only about taking life. It is not. And all you need to do is read the text. Now, there are verbs of killing. There are verbs of killing in specific episodes in the conquest accounts that are used, not coincidentally, in places where Anakim, the Amorite Rephaim giant clans, are located. I'm going to go through them. There aren't that many, but we'll just go through them. Numbers 13. Again, look at where we started back in Numbers 13, the hill country. And you have the Canaanites who dwell by the sea. Who are they? Well, they'd be the Philistines, okay? You know. What is the hill country? The report, again, tells us about the inhabitants of the hill country, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, again, so on and so forth. What is it? The hill country is basically, I mean, you can see in this map where it's hilly or mountainous, all the way up through here, from the south, the Negev, the hill country, all the way up through the side, through the land here, past Galilee and up into Upper Galilee. This is the hill country. All right. And then on the sea again, you're going to have you know, some Philistine settlements. You're going to have the five cities of the Philistines and whatnot. But again, there's a logic to it. And, and hill country is a consistent focus, including the hill country in the Negev. If we look at the places where the terms Anakim and sons of Anak occur, we get several more specific geographical references. You get Hebron, Kiriath Arba, Devir, Anab, situated in the hill country. Okay, general descriptions, all the hill country of Judah. The Anakim are not said to be found in other areas, just throughout the hill country. Again, including the hill country, the Negev, you get some of that. Cities of Jericho, Jerusalem, Lachish, and Ai are in the hill country, as was Hazor. And I'm mentioning these because these are the places where the Karem commands are issued. It's not Karem everything. It's when you're in the hill country, okay, there's going to be Karem going on. And it's going to be in the places where these people live. And again, the Anakim, the sons of Anak. Not surprisingly, towns, cities that the king of Hazor sent aid to versus the Israelites are also in the hill country. So they, they, you know, that's a very poor decision on his part. So he's going to loop himself into this, you know. Though the precise locations of some of the sites are unknown, the biblical narrative associates them all with the hill country. Okay, and here we go. We have one kind of map over here, then you got the, the, the topographic over here, and you can see, you know, you just look at the place names, they're all in the hill country. Again, there's a reason for this, because of who lives in the hill country. Because of where the, the sons of Anak, the Anakim and the Rephaim and all, you know, the, the, this is where they're spotted, in the hill country. Again, this is not a coincidence. It's not coincidental. It's not random. If you look at the killing verbs, cherem, in the conquest of sound, uh, accounts, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you get it with Zion and Og. They're descendants, they're the Amorite kings, and uh, we know Og for sure is a giant. Zion is, is probably as well because of the association with Og. They're under Karem. Joshua 2, Jericho, in the hill country. Josh, you know, I, in the hill country. Joshua 10, all these places. Joshua left none remaining. They're all in the hill country. They're all places where the Anakim were spotted. And Joshua 11, Hazor, hill country. Again, this is why, this is my position. This is why I think the whole point of the way Joshua wraps up the conquest, how he defines victory, is there are no more Anakim in the land. He doesn't say there are no more humans in the land. He says, no, there are no more Anakim in the land. He doesn't even say there's no more Canaanites. He says, there's no more Anakim in the land. They become a consistent reference point. 
A couple other verbs of killing, avad. Now in the Joshua references here, it has the Israelites in view that they're under threat. They could be, they could be destroyed by their enemies. But the lemma is used in Numbers 21 of Sion and Og, Deuteronomy 7 and 9 of the warfare that's going to happen once they get into Canaan. Shamad, to destroy. This lemma is used in Deuteronomy 9, Joshua 9, 11, and 24, all of the conquest, and every time they occur, it's in association with the hill country. Every time. It's also the lemma used in Amos 2.9 to describe the demise of the very tall Amorites in Amos's recounting of the conquest. What I'm trying to, to communicate here is this is a consistent picture and it is driven by a theological rationale. Again, like I said with, with Joshua, when he winds up, he doesn't say, hey, there's no more humans in the land. We're supposed to just kill everybody. No, he says there are no more Anakim in the land except the ones that ran away to the Philistines. You know, they're, they're their buddies over there. You know. There's still business to be taken care of after the conquest. We're going to run into Philistines later when the new Joshua is in town. His name is David. Again, it's not a coincidence. We'll talk about next class period about the similarities, some of the similarities between Joshua and David and Moses and Jesus. Again, there, there, there are some del deliberate typology going on here. That again, it's very easy for us to miss. So last slide, return to the fundamental questions. How would the ancient readers of the conquest accounts have processed these accounts? How would the biblical writers have thought about what they were writing? I'll tell you how they wouldn't have thought about it. They wouldn't have thought about it the way it's presented on YouTube. Okay, they wouldn't have thought about it the way it's presented on Facebook. There's a context here. It is live or be killed because it's not everybody that we have to worry about. We can dispossess people. We don't have to kill them. We can just drive them out. You know, God promised us this land and, and they, have to, they either have to join us as Israelites or they're gone. But there are some, again, in the hill country, the descendants of Anak, that have a very long history that goes back to the flood story and the Apkalu and associated stories, you know, depending on what their, their ethnic tradition has, their texts, you know, the, the Hittite texts or whatever, the Horian text. There are some people who can trace their lineage and have done so all the way back to the, the second rebellion. And they form a lethal threat. The, the agenda now is not, is not only to, to increase depravity so that we never return to the true God and have life. Now the agenda is to kill us off. So God says, we have to deal with that. We must deal with that. This is why I'm bringing you here. It's why I took you up the Transjordan. Okay, we've got to take care of business in Bashan. It's why you're going to cross in and you're going to confront the very people that made you chicken out in the first place and caused your 40 years of wandering. It must be done. And that, again, is, is a, a completely different worldview context for thinking about the conquest.